the Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. Book three, argument, the duel of Menelaus and Paris. The armies being ready to engage, a single combat is agreed upon between Menelaus and Paris by the intervention of Hector for the determination of the war. Iris is sent to call Helen to behold the fight. She leads her to the walls of Troy, where Priam sits with his counselors observing the Grecian leaders on the plain below, to whom Helen gives an account of the chief of them. The kings on either part take the solemn oath for the conditions of the combat. The duel ensues, wherein Paris, being overcome, he is snatched away in a cloud by Venus and transported to his apartment. She then calls Helen from the walls and brings the lovers together. Agamemnon, on the part of the Grecians, demands the restoration of Helen and the performance of the articles. The three and twentieth day still continues throughout this book. The scene is sometimes in the fields before Troy and sometimes in Troy itself. Thus, by their leader's care, each martial band moves into ranks and stretches o'er the land. With shouts, the Trojans, rushing from afar, proclaim their motions and provoke the war. So, when inclement winters vex the plain, with piercing frosts or thick descending rain, to warmer seas the cranes embodied fly, with noise and order through the midway sky. To pygmy nations wounds and death they bring, and all the war descends upon the wing, but silent, breathing, rage resolved and skilled, by mutual aids to fix a doubtful field, swift march the Greeks. The rapid dust, around darkening, arises from the labored ground. Thus, from his flaggy wings, when notice shed a night of vapors round the mountain heads, swift gliding mists the dusky fields invade, to thieves more grateful than the midnight shade, while scarce the swains their feeding flocks survey, lost and confused amidst the thickened day. So wrapped in gathering dust the Grecian train, a moving cloud swept on and hid the plain. Now front to front the hostile armies stand, eager of fight and only wait command, when to the van before the sons of fame whom Troy sent forth. The beauteous Paris came in form a god. The panther's speckled hide flowed o'er his armor with an easy pride. His bended bow across his shoulders flung, his sword beside him negligently hung. Two pointed spears he shook with gallant grace and dared the bravest of the Grecian race. As thus, with glorious air and proud disdain, he boldly stalked the foremost on the plain, him, Menelaus, loved of Mars, espies, with heart elated and with joyful eyes, so joys a lion, if the branching deer or mountain goat his bulky prize appear. Eager, he seizes and devours the slain, pressed by bold youths and baying dogs in vain. Thus fond of vengeance, with a furious bound and clanging arms, he leaps upon the ground from his high chariot. Him, approaching near, the beauteous champion views with marks of fear, smit with a conscious sense, retires behind and shuns the fate he well deserved to find. As when some shepherd from the rustling trees shot forth to view a scaly serpent sees, trembling and pale, he starts with wild affright, and all confused precipitates his flight. So from the king the shining warrior flies, and plunged amid the thickest Trojan lies. As godlike Hector sees the prince retreat, he thus upbraids him with a generous heat. Unhappy Paris, but to women brave, so fairly formed and only to deceive, O oh, hadst thou died when first thou sawest the light, or died at least before thy nuptial rite, a better fate than vainly thus to boast, and fly the scandal of thy Trojan host. Gods, how the scornful Greeks exult to see their fears of danger undeceived in thee, thy figure promised with a martial air, but ill thy soul supplies a form so fair. In former days in all thy gallant pride, when thy tall ships triumphant stemmed the tide, when Greece beheld thy painted canvas flow, and crowds stood wondering at the passing show, say, was it thus, with such a baffled mien, you met the approaches of the Spartan queen? Thus from her realm conveyed the beauteous prize, and both her warlike lords outshined in Helen's eyes? This deed, thy foe's delight, thy own disgrace, thy father's grief, and ruin of thy race. This deed recalls thee to the proffered flight, or hast thou injured whom thou darest not write. Soon to thy cost the feud would make thee known, thou keepest the consort of a braver foe, thy graceful form instilling soft desire, thy curling tresses and thy silver lyre, beauty and youth, 
In vain to these you trust, when youth and beauty shall be laid in dust. Troy yet may wake, and one avenging blow crush the dire author of his country's woe. His silence here, with blushes, Paris breaks. Tis just, my brother, what your anger speaks, but who like thee can boast a soul sedate so firmly proof to all the shocks of fate? Thy force, like steel, a tempered hardness shows, still edged to wound and still untired with blows, like steel uplifted by some strenuous swain with falling woods to strew the wasted plain. Thy gifts I praise, nor thou despise the charms with which a lover golden Venus arms, soft moving speech and pleasing outward show, no wish can gain them but the gods bestow. Yet wouldst thou have the proffered combat stand, the Greeks and Trojans seat on either hand, then let a midway space our hosts divide, and on that stage of war the cause be tried by Paris. There the Spartan king be fought for beauteous Helen and the wealth she brought, and who his rival can in arms subdue, his be the fair, and his the treasure too. Thus, with a lasting league, your toils may cease, and thus Troy possesses her fertile fields in peace. Thus may the Greeks view their native shore, much famed for generous steeds, for beauty more. He said. The challenge Hector heard with joy, then with a spear restrained the youth of Troy, held by the midst athwart, and near the foe advanced with steps majestically slow, while round his dauntless head the Grecians pour their stones and arrows in a mingled shower. Then thus the monarch great Atreides cried, Forbear ye warriors, lay the doors aside. A parley Hector asks, a message bears, we know him by the various plume he wears. Awed by his high command, the Greeks attend, the tumult silence, and the fight suspend. While from the centre Hector rolls his eyes on either host, and thus to both applies, Hear all ye Trojan, all ye Grecian bands, what Paris, author of the war, demands. Your shining swords within the sheath restrain, and pitch your lances in the yielding plain. Here in the midst, in either army's sight, he dares the Spartan king to single fight, and wills that Helen and the ravished spoil that caused the contest shall reward the toil. Let these the brave triumphant victor grace, and different nations part in leagues of peace. He spoke. In still suspense on either side each army stood, the Spartan chief replied, Me too, ye warriors here, whose fatal right a world engages in the toils of fight. To me the labor of the field resign, me, Paris injured, all the war be mine. For all he that must beneath his rival's arms, and live the rest secure of future harms. Two lambs devoted by your country's right, to earth a sable, to the sun a white. Prepare ye Trojans, while a third we bring select to Jove, the inviolable king. Let revered Priam in the truce engage, and add the sanction of considerate age. His sons are faithless, headlong in debate, and youth itself an empty, wavering state. Cool age advances venerably wise, turns on all hands its deep discerning eyes, sees what befell, and what may yet befall, concludes from both, and best provides for all. The nations here with rising hopes possessed, and peaceful prospects dawn in every breast. Within the lines they drew their steeds around, and from their chariots issued on the ground. Next, all unbuckling the rich mail they wore, laid their bright arms along the sable shore. On either side the meeting hosts are seen with lances fixed, and close the space between. Two heralds now dispatched to Troy invite the Phrygian monarch to the peaceful rite. Talthibius hastens to the fleet, to bring the lamb for Jove, the inviolable king. Meantime, to beauteous Helen, from the skies the various goddess of the rainbow flies, like fair Laodice in form and face, the loveliest nymph of Priam's royal race. Her in the palace at her loom she found, the golden web her own sad story crowned. The Trojan wars she weaved, herself the prize, and the dire triumphs of her fatal eyes. To whom the goddess of the painted bow, approach and view the wondrous scene below, each hardy Greek and valiant Trojan knight, so dreadful late and furious for the fight, now rest their spears, or lean upon their shields, ceased is the war and silent all the fields. Paris alone and Sparta's king advance, in single fight to toss the beamy lance, each met in arms the fate of combat tries, thy love the motive, and thy charms the prize. This said, the many-coloured maid inspires her husband's love and wakes her former fires. 
her country, parents, all that once were dear, rush to her thought and force a tender tear. O'er her fair face a snowy veil she threw, and softly sighing from the loom withdrew. Her handmaids, Clymene and Aethra, wait her silent footsteps to the Scaean gate. There sat the seniors of the Trojan race, Lord Priam's chiefs, and most in Priam's grace, the king, the first, Thaumaetes at his side, Lampus and Cletius, long in council tried, Panthus and Hisaktion, once the strong, and next the wisest of the revered throng, Antenor, grave and sage, Ucalagon, leaned on the walls and basked before the sun, chiefs who no more in bloody fights engage, but wise through time and narrative with age, in summer days, like grasshoppers, rejoice a bloodless race that send a feeble voice. These, when the Spartan queen approached the tower, in secret owned resistless beauty's power. They cried, No wonder such celestial charms, for nine long years have set the world in arms. What winning graces, what majestic mien! She moves a goddess, and she looks a queen. Yet hence, O oh heaven, convey that fatal face, and from destruction save the Trojan race. The good old Priam welcomed her, and cried, Approach, my child, and grace thy father's side. She on the plain, thy Grecian spouse, appears, the friends and kindred of thy former years. No crime of thine our pleasant suffering straws, not thou, but heaven's disposing will, the cause, the gods, these armies, and this force employ. The hostile gods conspire the fate of Troy. But lift thy eye, and say, What Greek! is he, far as from hence these aged orbs can see, around whose brow such martial graces shine, so tall, so awful, and almost divine. Though some of larger stature tread the green, none match his grandeur and exalted mien, he seems a monarch in his country's pride. Thus ceased the king, and thus the fair replied, Before thy presence, father, I appear, with conscious shame and reverential fear. Ah! Had I died, ere to these walk I fled, false to my country and my nuptial bed. My brothers, friends, and daughter left behind, false to them all, to Paris only kind. For this I mourn till grief or dire disease shall waste the form whose fault it was to please. The king of kings, Atrides, you survey, great in the war and great in arts of sway. My brother once, before my days of shame, and oh, that still he bore a brother's name. With wonder Priam viewed the godlike man, extolled the happy prince, and thus began. O blessed Atreides, born to prosperous fate, successful monarch of a mighty state, how vast thy empire, of your matchless train, what numbers lost, what numbers yet remain. In Phrygia once were gallant armies known in ancient time, when Otreus filled the throne, when godlike Magdon led their troops of horse, and I to join them raised the Trojan force. Against the man like Amazons we stood, and Sangar's stream ran purple with their blood. But far inferior those in martial grace, and strength of numbers to this Grecian race. This said, once more he viewed the warrior train. What's he whose arms lie scattered on the plain? Broad is his breast, his shoulders larger spread, though great Atrides overtops his head. Nor yet appear his care and conduct small, from rank to rank he moves and orders all. The stately ram thus measures o'er the ground, and master of the flock surveys them round. Then Helen, thus, whom your discerning eyes have singled out, is Ithacus the wise. A barren island boasts his glorious birth, his fame for wisdom fills the spacious earth. Antenor took the word, and thus began. Myself, O king, have seen that wondrous man when, trusting Jove and hospitable laws, to Troy he came to plead the Grecian cause. Great Menelaus urged the same request. My house was honored with each royal guest. I knew their persons and admired their parts, both brave in arms and both approved in arts. Erect, the Spartan most engaged our view, Ulysses seated, greater reverence drew. When Atreus' son harangued the listening train, just was his sense and his expression plain. His words succinct yet full without a fault. He spoke no more than just the thing he ought, but when Ulysses rose in thought profound, his modest eyes he fixed upon the ground. As one unskilled or dumb he seemed to stand, nor raised his head nor stretched his sceptred hand. But when he speaks what elocution flows, soft as the fleeces of descending snows, 
The copious accents fall with easy art, melting they fall and sink into their heart. Wondering we hear, and fixed in deep surprise, our ears refute the censure of our eyes. The king then asked, as yet the camp he viewed, What chief is that, with giant strength endued, whose brawny shoulders and whose swelling chest and lofty stature far exceed the rest? Ajax the Great, the beauteous queen replied, himself a host, the Grecian strength and pride. See, bold Idomeneus, superior towers, amid yon circle of his Cretan powers, great as a god. I saw him once before with Menelaus on the Spartan shore. The rest I know, and could in order name, all valiant chiefs and men of mighty fame. Yet two are wanting of the numerous train, whom long my eyes have sought, but sought in vain. Castor and Pollux, first in martial force, one bold on foot and one renowned for horse. My brothers these, the same our native shore, one house contained us as one mother bore. Perhaps the chiefs from warlike toils at ease for distant Troy refused to sail the seas. Perhaps their swords some nobler quarrel draws, ashamed to combat in their sister's cause. So spoke the fair, nor knew her brother's doom, wrapped in the cold embraces of the tomb, adorned with honors in their native shore. Silent they slept, and heard of wars no more. Meantime the heralds, through the crowded town, bring the rich wine and destined victims down. Idaeus arms the golden goblets pressed, who thus the venerable king addressed, Arise, O father of the Trojan state. The nations call thy joyful people wait to seal the truce and end the dire debate. Paris thy son, and Sparta's king advance in measured lists to toss the weighty lance, and who his rival shall in arms subdue, his be the dame, and his the treasure too. Thus with a lasting league our toils may cease, and Troy possess her fertile fields in peace, so shall the Greeks renew their native shore, much famed for generous steeds, for beauty more. With grief he heard, and bade the chiefs prepare to join his milk-white courses to the car. He mounts the seat, Antenor at his side. The gentle steeds through Scaea's gates they guide. Next from the car, descending on the plain, amid the Grecian host and Trojan train, slow they proceed. The sage Ulysses then arose, and with him rose the king of men. On either side a sacred herald stands. The wine they mix, and on each monarch's hands pour the full urn. Then draw the Grecian lord his cutlass sheathed beside his ponderous sword. From the signed victims crops the curling hair. The heralds part it, and the princes share. Then loudly thus, before the attentive bands, he calls the gods, and spreads his lifted hands. O first and greatest power, whom all obey, who high on Ida's holy mountain sway, eternal Jove, a new bright orb that roll from east to west and view from pole to pole, thou mother earth, and all ye living floods, infernal furies, and Tartarian gods, who rule the dead and horrid woes, prepare for perjured kings and all who falsely swear, hear and be witness, if by Paris slain great Menelaus press the fatal plain, the dame and the treasures let the Trojan keep, and Greece returning plough the watery deep. If by my brother's lance the Trojan bleed, be his the wealth and beauteous dame decreed. The appointed fine let Ilion justly pay, and every age record the signal day. This, if the Phrygians shall refuse to yield, arms must revenge, and Mars decide the field. With that the chief, the tender victim, slew, and in the dust their bleeding bodies threw. The vital spirit issued at the wound, and left the members quivering on the ground. From the same urn they drink the mingled washings to the powers divine, while thus their prayers united mount the sky. Hear, mighty Jove, and hear ye gods on high. And may their blood, who first the league confound, shed like this wine disdain the thirsty ground. May all their consorts serve promiscuous lust, and all their lust be scattered as the dust. Thus either host their imprecations joined, which Jove refused, and mingled with the wind. The rites now finished, revered Priam rose, and thus expressed a heart o'ercharged with woes. Ye Greeks and Trojans, let the chiefs engage, but spare the weakness of my feeble age. In yonder walls that object let me shun, nor view the danger of so dear a son, whose arms shall conquer, and what prince shall fall, heaven only knows, for heaven disposes all. This said, the hoary king no longer stayed, but on his car the slaughtered victims laid, then seized the reins, his gentle steeds to guide, and drove to Troy, Antenor at his side. Bold Hector and Ulysses now dispose the lists of combat and the ground enclose. 
next to decide by secret lots prepare who first shall launch his pointed spear in air. The people pray with elevated hands, and words like these are heard through all the bands. Immortal Jove, high heaven's superior lord, on lofty Ida's holy mount adored, who e'er involved us in this dire debate, O oh, give that author of the war to fate, and shades eternal let division cease, and joyful nations join in leagues of peace. With eyes averted, Hector hastes to turn the lots of fight, and shakes the brazen urn. Then Paris, thine leaped forth, by fatal chance ordained the first to whirl the weighty lance. Both armies sat the combat to survey. Beside each chief his azure armor lay, and round the lists the generous courses neigh. The beauteous warrior now arrays for fight in gilded arms magnificently bright. The purple coeches clasp his thighs around with flowers adorned with silver buckles bound. Lycaon's corslet, his fair body dressed, braced in and fitted to his softer breast, a radiant baldric o'er his shoulder tied, sustained the sword that glittered at his side. His youthful face a polished helm all spread, the waving horsehair nodded on his head. His figured shield, a shining orb, he takes, and in his hand a pointed javelin shakes, with equal speed and fired by equal charms, the Spartan hero sheathes his limbs in arms. Now round the lists the admiring armies stand, with javelins fixed, the Greek and Trojan band. Amidst the dreadful veil the chiefs advance, all pale with rage, and shake the threatening lance. The Trojan first his shining javelin threw, full on Atrides' ringing shield it flew, nor pierced the brazen orb, but with a bound leaped from the buckler blunted on the ground. Atrides then his massy lance prepares in act to throw, but first prefers his prayers. Give me, great Jove, to punish lawless lust, and lay the Trojan gasping in the dust. Destroy the aggressor, aid my righteous cause, avenge the breach of hospitable laws. Let this example future times reclaim, and guard from wrong fair friendship's holy name. Be said, and poised in air, the javelin sent. Through Paris's shield the forceful weapon went. His corslet pierces, and his garment rends, and glancing downward near his flank descends. The wary Trojan, bending from the blow, eludes the death and disappoints his foe. But fierce Atrides waved his sword and struck full on his cask. The crested helmet shook. The brittle steel, unfaithful to his hand, broke short. The fragments glittered on the sand. The raging warrior to the spacious skies raised his upbraiding voice and angry eyes. Then is it vain in Jove himself to trust? And is it thus the gods assist the just? When crimes provoke us, heaven success denies. The dart falls harmless, and the falchion flies. Furious, he said, and towards the Grecian crew, seized by the crest, the unhappy warrior drew. Struggling, he followed, while the embroidered thong that tied his helmet dragged the chief along. Then had his ruin crowned Atrides' joy. But Venus trembled for the prince of Troy. Unseen she came, and burst the golden band, and left an empty helmet in his hand. The cask, enraged amidst the Greeks, he threw. The Greeks with smiles the polished trophy view. Then, as once more he lifts the deadly dart, in thirst of vengeance at his rival's heart, the queen of love her favorite champion shrouds, for gods can all things in a veil of clouds. Raised from the field, the panting youth she led, and gently laid him on the bridal bed with pleasing sweets, his fainting sense renews, and all the dome perfumes with heavenly dews. Meantime, the brightest of the female kind, the matchless Helen, o'er the walls reclined. To her, beset with Trojan beauties, came, in borrowed form, the laughter-loving dame. She seemed an ancient maid, well-skilled to cull the snowy fleece, and wind the twisted wool. The goddess softly shook her silken vest that shed perfumes, and whispering thus addressed, Haste, happy nymph, for thee thy Paris calls, safe from the fight in yonder lofty walls. Fair as a god with odors round him spread, he lies and waits thee on the well-known bed. Not like a warrior parted from the foe, but some gay dancer in the public show. She spoke, and Helen's secret soul was moved. She scorned the champion, but the man she loved, fair Venus's neck, her eyes that sparkled fire, and breast revealed the queen of soft desire. Struck with her presence, straight the lively red forsook her cheek, and trembling thus she said, 
then is it still thy pleasure to deceive, and woman's frailty always to believe? Say, to new nations must I cross the main, or carry wars to some soft Asian plain, for whom must Helen break her second vow? What other Paris is thy darling now? Left to Atrides, victor in the strife, an odious conquest, and a captive wife, hence let me sail, and if thy Paris bear my absence ill, let Venus ease his care. A handmaid goddess at his side to wait, renounce the glories of thy heavenly state, be fixed for heir to the Trojan shore, his spouse or slave, and mount the skies no more. For me, to lawless love no longer let, I scorn the coward and detest his bed, else should I merit everlasting shame, and keen reproach from every Phrygian dame. Ill suits it now the joys of love to know, too deep my anguish, and too wild my woe. Then, thus incensed, the Paphian queen replies, Obey the power from whom thy glories rise. Should Venus leave thee, every charm must fly, fade from thy cheek, and languish in thy eye. Cease to provoke me, lest I make thee more the world's aversion than their love before. Now the bright prize for which mankind engage, than the sad victim of the public rage. At this the fairest of her sex obeyed, and veiled her blushes in a silken shade, unseen and silent from the train she moves, led by the goddess of the smiles and loves, arrived and entered at the palace gate, the maids officious round their mistress wait, then all dispersing various tasks attend. The queen and goddess to the prince ascend, full in her Paris sight, the queen of love had placed the beauteous progeny of Jove, where, as he viewed her charm, she turned away her glowing eyes, and thus began to say, Is this the chief who, lost to sense of shame, late fled the field and yet survives his fame? Oh, hadst thou died beneath the righteous sword of that brave man whom once I called my lord! The boast of Paris oft desired the day with Sparta's king to meet in single fray. Go now once more, thy rival's rage excite, provoke Atrides, and renew the fight. Yet Helen bids thee stay, lest thou unskilled shouldst fall an easy conquest on the field. The prince replies, Ah, cease, divinely fair, nor add reproaches to the wounds I bear. This day the foe prevailed by Pallas's power. We may yet vanquish in a happier hour. There want not gods to favor us above, but let the business of our life be love. These softer moments let delights employ, and kind embraces snatch the hasty joy. Not thus I loved thee when from Sparta's shore my forced, my willing heavenly prize I bore, when first entranced in Cranae's isle I lay, mixed with thy soul, and all dissolved away. Thus, having spoke, the enamoured Phrygian boy rushed to the bed, impatient for the joy. Him Helen followed, slow with bashful charms, and clasped the blooming hero in her arms. While these to love's delicious rapture yield, the stern Atrides rages round the field. So some fell lion whom the woods obey roars through the desert and demands his prey. Paris he seeks, impatient to destroy, but seeks in vain along the troops of Troy. Even those had yielded to a foe so brave, the recreant warrior hateful as the grave. Then speaking thus the king of kings arose, Ye Trojans, Dardans, all our generous foes, here and attest from heaven with conquest crowned, our brothers' arms the just success have found. Be therefore now the Spartan wealth restored. Let Argive Helen own her lawful lord. The appointed fine let Ilion justly pay, and age to age record this signal day. He ceased. The army's loud applauses rise, and the long shout runs echoing through the skies. The end of Book Three of the Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope.